how does it act on my scalar function? The answer is given by roughly this visualization over here, which is that if I give you a scalar function represented by the blue curve, then the gradient of the scalar function at this point is going to be the is going to be the direction in which it increases maximally. So let's say imagine I'm a traveler on a hill, right? I stand here, then I want to go to the top of the hill. I want to go to to, to the highest point on the hill. Then I ask myself which direction should I move in to increase my height? Then that direction will be the gradient of the scalar function. Okay? And um, yeah, so so you can also visualize gradient using level sets. So if I if I you can imagine level sets as imagine the, the, the scalar function of the hill, right? Then level sets are kind of like your water level. So if I increase the water level, there will be certain points where the water meets the land. So your level sets are basically points on the original on the domain of the function, the x and y, right? The, the points in space where the phi takes on a specific constant value. Okay, so far? Then then let's say I'm over here, the gradient of the scalar field at this point will be perpendicular to the level curves. That makes sense, right? And, and, the, and the magnitude of the vector, right, will be how much it increases if I move in that direction. So this is this is the intuition for your um, typical gradient of a scalar function. Okay, so so when I give you a scalar function, you can take a gradient and you can return me a vector field. But then you can also take something known as a directional derivative. So the directional derivative is um, it takes two, not only the scalar function, but it also takes a vector v. And the vector v indicates which direction you want to move in. So let's say I'm on a hill, and you, so if you give me a scalar function, you give me a hill, right? If I'm on a hill, and you give me a vector v, the vector v represents which direction I want to step in next. And the direction of derivative, grad v of phi, will be how much the hill, how much the height of the hill increases if I step in the direction. Okay, so, so this is another thing, you, this is another operation you can do with a scalar function phi, but it requires another additional input v. And so the definition for the direction derivative is just this thing, right? This looks like your signal derivative, but just that the inputs are vectors. Okay, so, so the, the key idea is how does this relate to your, what, why am I mentioning the direction derivative? The reason is because if you tailor expand the definition over here, you can actually check that gradient of grad v of phi, or the direction derivative, is equal to the vector v dot with the vector field grad phi. Okay, so, so this is, the reason why I mentioned this is because um, this gives us a different perspective of how to think of my grad phi. Okay, so, so first of all, let me just um, mention something that you should take note of, <coughs> which is that the left hand, in this equation, Right? The left hand side is the direction derivative, which means the left hand side is a scalar. The right hand side is a scalar also, right? Because scalar must equal scalar. But how is the right hand side contracted? It's taking a vector v dotted with a vector field, grad phi. Right? So it's, the left hand side is just a direction derivative with a scalar. Right hand side is a vector dot vector field. Okay? So what this allows us to do is imagine if what, what does this grad phi mean? Just now we learned that. The, the typical intuition for grad phi is um, it's a direction in which you move to, in, to, to, to increase your height maximally, right? to increase the maximal increase. Right? But, but now you can think of this grad phi as, uh, as something that is waiting for vector v. And then, if, if, if you give it this vector v, you dot it with it, then it will give you the direction derivative. So the change in perspective is, just now I said grad phi is a, is a vector v. Right, which is true, but by mentioning the direction derivative, after I give this direction derivative, I want you guys to think of grad phi as something that's waiting for a vector before outputting a scalar field. Okay, so so it's, it's okay. It's quite, um, it's quite, it's quite. Uh, 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 it, it might be quite new, but essentially, I'm leaving. I can think of grad phi as leaving this v blank, and it's waiting for a vector, and it outputs a scalar function. So if if you are familiar with mathematical terminology. This would be phrased mathematically. This tells you that um, this, this is this is a statement about the isomorphism between the vector space and its dual. Okay, but but it's okay if you didn't um, catch that. Okay, so it red pi is waiting for a vector before it outputs a scalar field before it outputs a real number. Okay, so with with that we are ready to move on to more dimensions. So so far we deal with two dimensions, but our function can take many more dimensions, right? In three D, four D and so on. 
So 2D, right? For example, I define a scalar field that is this form. 3D, I can define something like that. In n dimensions, right? If I have a finite number of dimensions, I can denote it like that, right? A set of all variables. And then I can say, oh, sum over for the xi squared, right? Now we're going to do something a bit more extreme. We're going to say infinitely many variables. And how do I represent infinitely many variables? You can represent it with a function, f of x. More, more on this later. But essentially, this sum becomes an integral. Okay, so, so now the key idea over here, by introducing more dimensions, by, by bringing us to infinite dimensions, um, you can think of infinitely many, infinitely many dimensions as a function. In other words, a function can also be thought, as, thought of as an infinite dimensional vector. Okay, that's, that's, okay so right now, I, I, may, I may seem crazy, but oh, oh, just, just be rest assured that um, <laughs> all this has very rigorous mathematical backing, and it's studied in functional calculus. Uh, variation calculus and um, yeah, all, all this is very rigorous. But I I I may sound um, crazy right now because I'm trying to introduce it uh, without talking about all the math. I'm trying to introduce it in a, into a different way, and I hope I hope it is is working. Right. So anyway, now you can think of functions as infinitely many variables. And if you think about it, it kind of makes sense. When when you specify a function, you're actually specifying infinitely many real numbers, right? One for each input. Okay. And of course, you usually write that as f of x equals x squared, but actually, that just tells you this point is 0, this point is 1, this point is 4, this point is um, 9, and so on. So, yeah, so with this idea, you can think of, uh, you can think of the infinitely many variables as different points along the function. So f of 0 is one variable, f of 0.1, uh, 0 0.01 is one variable. Of course, there's infinitely many in between. There's uh, un uncountably, amount infinite, uncountably infinite many variables, right? And uh, mathematically, you call it a Hilbert space. So you heard do quantum mechanics, you heard of that. Right? We use this idea in, in, in quantum mechanics as well. Okay. Um, so um, um, the, the, in math, we need to be careful of some stuff about convergence and, and whatnot. But but this is intuition. Okay. So so just now we saw a definition of a function. Just, just now what we saw is a functional. Right. What this, this phi over here and the, the last one over here is uh, infinite dimension analog of the following tree. But the last one is what we call a functional phi because it eats functions and it outputs real numbers. Make sense? Right? So, so a function eats inputs and outputs and, and outputs something. Functionals eat functions and output a real number. So with that, what if we want to define something more like um, for finite dimensions we can have something like xy plus yz, right? That's a valid scalar function. But what if you want to do that for infinite dimensions, then then you, you can you can you can rewrite x, y plus y, z as a, as a difference of squares. And then now we see something over here. We see this is y minus x, right? This is one variable minus the neighboring variable, right? So what does that look like? That looks like a derivative, right? So, so <laughs> one, one variable minus the neighboring variable, right? So if I take that idea, then we can see that my functional phi of f can be written as uh, integral of dx of this this thing, right? Derivative of f squared. So my functional not only does it, is it represented as integral, it can also it can also it can also um, perform derivatives on a function and then perform calculations with them, right? And this is something that could look a lot like your Lagrangian, right? So so now 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 is when we come to physics. So this the uh, this is just some intuition for what the derivative is really doing. Okay, so question now. Um, okay, for, for those that have studied Lagrangian like, mechanics, you guys always see this expression, right? You see, right, the action of some uh, trajectory, action of some trajectory, like Q of T or T <coughs> is equal to something, something, integral of Lagrangian. And you always write that Lagrangian is taking in two inputs, f of x and f prime of x. And something I've always wondered uh, when, when I was studying it is, why, why does Lagrangian need to take f prime of x, right? So this is just notation. Right. Of course, if you know what you're doing, it's okay. But why, why do they always write f prime of x here? Right. I'm always wondering, you already have the, the f of x, can you calculate f of prime of x? And the answer um, to, to that is that, the answer that I, I came up with to that is that the Lagrangian is known as a local quantity. So I'll share with you an analogy to hopefully uh, understand why we, we write this notation, right? And why and what it means for Lagrangian, Lagrangian to be a local quantity. So what I mean by that is, um, imagine if, if you are, imagine if this integral, right, is a sum, right? It's a sum for every single point in space. You integrate over dx. So every point in space, you calculate something, right? Imagine now you have infinitely many workers, 
right? And you allocate them to these office compartments, right? And you tell each one of them, calculate the Lagrangian at your point. So we have a worker at x equals to 1, we have a worker at x equals to 2, we have a worker at x equals to pi, and so on, right? And you tell each one, each of the worker, calculate the Lagrangian and give me the answer. And then the worker, so what, what information does the worker need to calculate the Lagrangian? If you give the worker f of x, right? And you tell him to calculate an expression involving the derivative of x, uh, derivative of f, right? Then he, he must look to his neighbors, right? He must, he must ask a hey, neighbor, what's your what's your f of x? Neighbor, what's your f of x, right? x equals to one, the worker will need to talk to x equals to 1.0001, and x equals to one, the worker will need to also talk to um, x equals to f equals to 0.999. You talk to his neighbors to calculate the derivative. But what if you what if you are a strict boss and you don't want the, the, the workers to talk to their neighbors? Right? So you want to compartmentalize every single one of them. Right? So if you want to compartmentalize your workers, right, then you need to give each worker the derivative also. So he wouldn't need to talk to his neighbors. So that's that's my intuition for what it means by the Lagrangian to be a local quantity. Okay? So so yeah. Another thing is, why don't you have higher derivatives? So it turns out, if you write a Lagrangian with higher derivatives, then um, your Hamiltonian, which, which is your total total energy, will not make sense. And and you can search for this uh, Ostrogratsky instability. Um, I also have a lecture on the Lagrangian transform. So so, so the, the, the Hamiltonian is actually the Lagrangian transform of the Lagrangian. And if you perform the Lagrangian transform, you need some conditions on the, the quantity you are Lagrangian transforming. Right? And, and one of the conditions is convexity. So roughly speaking, you can imagine why f prime of x can be used, but f prime prime cannot be used because f prime prime is a second derivative. Um, yeah, so, so, so it's something to do with that. Um, I'll invite you guys to check it out if you're interested. So, so with that, we are ready to talk about our little Lagrange equations. Okay, so if I have if I, the action of a system, or the action of a trajectory, sorry, the action of a trajectory is defined to be the integral of the Lagrangian. So if I give you a, a function q of e, could be a vector, could be a, uh, q could be a vector, right? If then the the action of this path, q of e, will be defined as the integral of the Lagrangian with respect to time. So, so it, it, uh, do know that, um, as, as Dr. Tan mentioned, right, the, Lagrangian mechanics is more general than just classical mechanics. Right? If you use it in field theory, you use it in um, you use it to define electromagnetism, special relativity, you even use it to define string theory. Right? So Lagrangian mechanics is something that permeates almost all of physics. Um, yeah. So so of course for classical mechanics you get you get it to coincide with Newtonian mechanics. Um, yeah, so that, that's that's the action. So the action is represented as a functional because it's a function and outputs a real number. Okay, and 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 so there's a there's a concept called the principle of stationary principle of stationary action, which says that if my endpoints are already fixed, then what path does my q of t take? It the, what path does the particle take? The path it takes is something that makes the action stationary. So what is the stationary thing? We'll come to that soon, right? Um, and and for those who are familiar, essentially when you make action stationary, you come up with the Euler Lagrange equation, and usually. You, you don't really care about, for physics Olympic, you don't really care about derivation, right? And usually you just work directly from the Euler Lagrange equation. And so, um, question, where does the principle of stationary action come from? It seems quite arbitrary. How come the particle know the entire trajectory, like how come it minimizes the entire trajectory whenever the particle is actually just a local kind of quantity? Actually, being a bit philosophical, I think it comes from the path integral, um, Feynman's path integral in quantum mechanics, right? Because you have, you have if something like e to the i s, and e is something called a, known as a stationary phase approximation. Okay, so, so principle of stationary action, I don't think we really know, I don't think humans really know where it comes from immediately, because the path integral is not rigorously defined yet, but you can, you can, you can roughly, um, I, 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 it's probably from the path integral, yeah. But path integral is not mathematically defined yet, not rigorously defined. Okay, so anyway, Talking about the derivation of whether the Gaussian equation, we come back to um, functional calculus. So just now, all the math we talked about now is going to be used. So when um, when we write delta of s is equal to zero, what is the delta? The delta is actually known as a functional differential. And in, in this talk, I hope to convince you that the functional differential is an infinitely dimensional, infinite dimensional analog of your gradient operator, right? So what does the 
gradient operator do again? Remember, the gradient operator is a scalar function, and it outputs, outputs a vector function, right? a vector field. Your, so your, your functional differential, likewise, would eat a scalar functional, right? Some, something that will eat a scalar, a scalar, essentially, and it outputs a vector, just that for infinite dimensions. So the, the functional differential actually eats your action S, right, which is a functional, a scalar functional, and it outputs a, a vector, a vector, a vector, but the vector is infinite dimensional. So what does it mean? It actually outputs a, 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 a function, essentially. And, and using the, the direction derivative idea, actually it doesn't output a, fu a function exactly. It actually outputs something that eats a function and then outputs a scalar. So it actually outputs a, what we call a linear functional. Yeah, so, 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 yeah, so it actually outputs a linear functional. So we get the, the, the delta of s is actually delta of s q of t, right? This is like your x, your location in, in, in multivariate calculus. And then this bullet over here represents a empty space. It's, this empty space is waiting for an input. The input we're waiting for is known as, I'll call it eta, but it's known as your, 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 your path variation. Okay? So this input is waiting for is actually the variation. And then when it, is a, when it is a variation, which I'll call eta of t, right, then it spits up a real number. So this, this over here, delta of s q of t, eta of t, right, it, this is your directional derivative, right? Eta is your vector v, and this is gradient. Okay, so I'll, I'll have more examples to illustrate what that means. Um, so this is analogous to how, you, when you take delta of s, it's analogous to grep of some scalar function. When you feed in v, when you, when you feed in v into the directional derivative, right, we take v dot gradient of phi, that's like v dot gradient of f, that's akin to plugging in your variation, eta, into your delta s. Right, this next point, eta goes into this next point. And when, it, when you, we have a directional derivative, right, v dot grad f, with or otherwise also known as uh, grad vf, that is actually your variation with respect to eta. Okay, so so this is this is direction derivative but taken to the infinite dimensions. So okay, so so we define the definition of your know, variation as is actually defined as such, right? And you can see that this is very similar to your definition for the directional derivative. Okay, so so this is your definition for the functional differential, right? And it mirrors almost identically, right? To, it, it, it's analogous to the directional derivative, just that this is for it eats functions, this one eats vectors. Okay, so, so this is a map between multivariate couplers in finite dimensions and functional couplers, which is just multivariate couplers but in infinite dimensions. So your functional S, your action, is essentially your scalar function phi. Your differential delta is essentially your gradient, nabla, right? Your, your infinitely many variables Q, of, which is represented as a function, is just your, it maps to your, your, your location in, in space. And your variation eta it maps to your um, the direction you want to move in, right? V, okay. E everyone good? I hope I hope I hope silence means yes. Okay, so so how do you derive all the Lagrange equations? You derive it, right? Remember we want to find stationary action. So we want to show that stationary principle of stationary action implies all the Lagrange equations. So how do we do that? Um, just that we 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 we, we look to multivariate complex in finite dimensions as a source of inspiration. So when we, whenever we take a scalar function phi and we're going to find stationary points of it, we're going to find a maximum or minimum, right? what do we do? We take gradient, right? And we take gradient <coughs> to set it equals to zero. Gradient, when it's equals to zero, means that grad d of phi, any directional derivative in any directions is zero, right? That makes sense because if you are the lowest point on the hill, wherever you walk, right, to first order, your, your, your chart doesn't change, right? Or your maximum, any, any direction you move doesn't, doesn't change your height for a, for a scalar function, right? This is just like your, your, yeah, your multivariate calculus. So likewise, we want to find a function, Q of t, that makes the, the direction of derivative zero for all variations eta, right? So, so yeah, so, so let's fill in the steps. So we fill in the steps, um, I, I, I for concreteness, I give an example of a scalar function phi here, right? I chose it because the, num the numbers here, you can choose any other function, right? If I want 
if I impose the condition that grad v of phi, the direction of the grad v of phi must be equal to zero as a vector, right, actually this, this zero should be, you have an arrow up here because it's bolded, it's a book vector. Wait, 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 no, 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 sorry, sorry, this is a scalar function, it's equal to scalar zero, right, this is not a vector, right. If, if, if I impose the condition that grad v of phi must be zero for all directions v, right, then extending out this grad v of phi for this function will give me vx dy dot this, this thing, right, so I take this, 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 this vector over here on the right hand side is just the gradient of this. You can you can check it for itself, right? And if I say that oh, v dot this vector must be equal to zero for all vectors v, that would just mean that this two x minus y and y minus x plus one is the zero vector. Make sense? And that essentially gives us two conditions: this and this. So you can see the lesson I want you guys to take away from here is that for each dimension, right? This case we have two dimensions. So from each dimension, we get one. Constraint, right? Each dimension you get one constraint, okay? And yeah, and, and likewise, if we have infinitely many dimensions, that gives us constraints, infinitely many constraints. Actually, this entire infinitely many constraints is your euler lagrange equation, okay? Your euler lagrange equation says that uh, blah, blah blah, right? Um, essentially, it's a, it's, it's this, it's these two constraints, but taken to infinitely many dimensions, right? Infinitely many variables, infinitely many constraints, and it's essentially a differential equation. So okay, so so with this with this example in mind, we can start to attack the infinite dimension case. So if I want, okay, so if I want the the direction of derivative with respect to eta, eta is a variation, right, to be equal to zero for all eta for all functions eta, right? Then I, I th this step from this one to this one is 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 going to be shown later, right? But if I want to, one can show this equality where this variation is equal to such a thing. And you can see that it's integral of dt of eta and this object here. Right? This object here is kind of like your, your 2x minus y and y minus x plus 1 vector here. Right? This object over here is the function. And this you recognize to be the euler lagrange equations. So if I say that integral of dt eta of this quantity must be 0 for all functions eta, the only case that the only way that can be true is if is if your your this thing inside the square bracket is zero is a zero function, okay? And so 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 that arises an euler lagrange equation. So all that remains to do, right, is to figure out this step from this left hand side to this right hand side, and that's what we're going to cover now, right? Um, and we we'll integral of parts and whatnot. So the, the parallel I want you guys to see in this case is that if I have v dot a vector equals to zero for all vectors v, that implies that the vector here must be zero. Okay. Likewise, if our integral of dt of some function times this square bracket thing <coughs> equals to zero for all functions eta, that would imply that this square bracket thing is zero. It's a zero function. And this and this dot product in infinite dimensions is the integral. Okay? Any if you guys have any questions, you can just um, raise your hand. Okay? Any anyone? Uh, yeah, question? Oh, oh, okay, okay. Acceleration mark, I, I'm, I'm saying that I impose that it must be equal to zero. It's just to emphasize that, yeah. It, it's not equals. It's, it's, it's just I impose that it must be equal to zero. I like to emphasize that because sometimes you write like like equals here, equals there, then you don't know which one is, you don't know if this is a step, right? Or you don't know if it's something we impose. So I like to, I like to just be clear. Questions? Yeah? Oh, why can't you just cite? Like, why is it also not possible that like the integral of eta is just zero or so? The integral of eta alone is zero, is it? Yeah. Like, eta itself, like... Oh, uh, so you're saying, why, why can't, oh, you're saying that why must this right hand side equal to zero <coughs> mean that this thing inside the square bracket must be zero? Yeah, like, eta itself... It, this could be zero itself everywhere, right? The answer is that this, this, this equation, equation 13, must hold true for all functions eta. Oh. Yeah, similar to how your equation Similar to how your equation 11 must hold true for all functions v. Does it make sense? Yeah, and any other questions? Just, just talk me at any point in time. Yeah. So, yeah. Feel free to, feel free to interject, by the way. Okay, so, so all that remains to do is to show the 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 factors now, right? To show that the variation of Q variation of S Q eta is equal to the the, the, the quantity over here. 
So how, how do we do that? The, the standard steps you see is here. Okay? So I'll explain each step clearly. And um, yeah, I'll explain each step clearly. So so okay, the, the thing about Lagrangian mechanics is when you first learn it, right, it's probably through like faculty or Kant or something. Right? And then and then he'll 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 write some equations down and then he'll he'll do all these steps and he'll say integral or parts. And then at the end you you get that left hand side equals to right hand side. But then I felt like when you first learn it, you, you never really quite understand why that is the case. And with the with the hindsight of back, with, of infinite dimensions, the, the, the analog just now, the, the energy just now, the intuition just now, I feel it's a lot clearer what's going on. So I hope to impart to you guys that intuition um, today. Okay, so so okay, so first of all, the, the first equality here is by definition, right? The variation of Q eta, if you go back a few slides, is the is the is by definition. Then we take the well, we take the derivative risk. so we take a derivative on the Grangian with respect to the parameter epsilon. And then you always see them write something like this. Like this step, this step is always something that confuses me, right? Why does it confuse me? It's because you take the you, you, you have Lagrangian, right? Lagrangian is what what is the Lagrangian? The Lagrangian is is a is a is a function, it eats q, right, and it is q dot, right, the time derivative of q. But then something that always puzzles me is how can I write partial of L with respect to partial of Q dot? Right? That, 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 that sounds very that sounds very odd, right? Q dot is like it's like it's like it's like okay, I'll, I'll go to the next slide. So what, what does that really mean? Okay? So the first step, the first equality, okay, I'll elaborate first on the, the first term over here. So we have this big term, right? This big term, there's two parts of it. One is this term and one is this term. Right? And so the first term I think is is, is more intuitive, right? What we're actually doing is we're essentially taking we're essentially taking um, we're essentially taking a partial derivative of L with respect to the Q at some time t. So 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 that's akin, right? This, this integral, integral of dt of this function and this eta is akin to taking is akin to taking the dot product, right? The integral is similar to the dot product, right? Then your 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 partial L partial Q is akin to your gradient. And your eta is akin to your v. Okay, so this this term, it, it kind of um, I think it's, it's more intuitive what's going on because you can think of it as, as this quantity over here, but for infinite dimensions. But what is not intuitive, what is less intuitive, is the term over here. Right? If I take the partial of L with respect to q dot, that that's akin. Remember, q dot in the finite dimensional case is kind of like your, it's kind of like y minus x. Right? What what does it mean to take a scalar function? With respect to y minus x, right? Um, and, 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 and yeah, so remember that this scalar function phi depends on x and y. <laughs> it, it, to me, when I first saw this, I, I was like, what, what's going on? How can you take the derivative with respect to um, of this difference? Okay, any questions? And so, so, so there are two things that I'll say to convince you guys. So one, one of the things, one of the one of the backing, theoretical backing for this is imagine if I have a multi rank function f x and y, but it depends on the function g, which is also a function of x and y, right? That's essentially your y, that's essentially your y minus x. Then if I take a total derivative of f respect to time, right, it expands by multi chain to be like that, right? And, and essentially what this is saying is that I can take partial f partial g if I treat g like a symbol, if I treat g like a symbol by itself, okay? And, and so that's what, that's one way to interpret that. You, if you treat y minus x like a symbol in itself, right? If you, yeah, but I have symbol G, and and the important point over here is that when we take the partial y and partial x, right, of f, you cannot, you cannot, you cannot expand out the G first, right? If you expand it out of G, then then there'll be no G dependence anymore. So this term will be zero, and then you take this, right? But if you don't expand out the G, then this is the multi chain rule, right? So I'll, re I'll repeat what I just said, right? Function depends on x, y, and G, right? G itself depends on x and y. If you expand out g, if you extend out g in terms of x and y, then your function depends on x and y only. And we take the multiplication root, you must cover this term. Right? It's only two terms over here, one for x, one for y. But if you don't expand out g, and in your in your function f you just write g over there, right, symbolically, then when you take the multiplication root, you must include this term. Okay, so that's essentially what's happening when we take uh, partial of the thing with respect to y minus x. Okay, so 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 it's about expansion. It's about symbolic expansion. That's the first thing. 
The second thing is always go back to first principles, right? So if you don't believe what I just said, um, then you, you can you can consider the first principles way, which is that if I if suppose I've some regression here, of course general regression will be more complicated. But suppose I've some regression here as a simple example, then if I, if I substitute the definition in, expand it out, you realize that um, yeah, you realize that since epsilon is small, you get this term, right? Which is this term, it it, it matches what you get. Um, if you symbolically pretend that L is just a function of Q dot, right? So, so there's, there's, there's a, there's a there's, you need to declare what's going on when you do stuff like that, because there is there is a numerical intuition for what's going on. Numerically, this is the intuition of what's going on numerically, right? But there's a symbolic, there's kind of a symbolic intuition also, which is that when you take partial L, partial Q dot, right? You don't think of Q dot as a difference of two points, as a derivative, right? You don't think of that. You think of Q dot as a symbol inside your Lagrangian, and then you just take symbolically. Okay, so so that's that's um. I hope these two things convince you. Um, yeah. So when we write partial L partial Q of with respect to Q dot, we actually mean symbolically Q and Q dot, and you take a partial derivative symbolically. Okay. Um, yeah. So what we're actually doing numerically is this, right? When we take partial L partial Q, what we're actually doing is you're you're, you're looking at one of the variables. Right, at time pi, you're looking at one of the variables, okay, and then you are differentiating the Lagrangian, which is the function, which, 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 which um, yeah, you're, you're differentiating with respect to one of the variables only, and this analogous to if I <coughs> partial phi with respect to partial x, where x partial phi, where, where phi is a function of x, y, z, I'm taking the with respect to one of the variables. So when we write this thing, what we actually mean is that partial l partial q is a is, is, is a function of time, but whenever you substitute in something, some time some point in time ti, right? This is what you're doing. Okay? So yeah. Okay, so so okay, so what we're actually doing when we do this kind of integral, right? Integrating dt, a function of time with a function of time, that's a dot product, right? This is a dot product. This thing also. Um, and if, if if all else fails, you can always go back to discretization, right? So imagine that. Q of t is not a continuous function, but it's instead a discrete function. We okay, do this numerically. So yeah, so 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 the upshot here is that I want you guys to take away if if, if all is confusing, right? If all is confusing, it's okay. Just go away, go home with the sentence. Um, go home with the sentence that integrals are infinite dimensional dot products, right? So the next time, next time, next time you you can you can you can you can tell your friends that. Um, <laughs> okay, so, so back to the online advantage proof, right? We have, we have covered essentially the conceptual leap from the equation 30 to equation 31. That's a conceptual leap. Um, the rest of it is actually quite is actually more or less um, quite quite straightforward because you you just have an integral of function function blah blah blah. Right, so this term, first term doesn't change. This second term, you see, you want to move the time derivative away from eta. Because remember the goal was to isolate eta, isolate the variation. So you take, a, you take the integral of parts, right? So you get this term minus this term. And here's where we use the endpoint, the fact that endpoint must be fixed, right? So if your endpoint must be fixed, then whatever variation you do, the variation of the endpoints must be zero. So your eta of tb and eta of ta, the two endpoints in time, must be zero. So this, this term, this middle term cancels out. And what you left over is, this quantity over here. Okay, so so this is this is nice because this quantity, equation thirty four, is precisely what we set out to prove, right? Is the integral of dt eta with this square bracket, which is essentially your vector v dotted with your grad, uh, your your yeah your your gradient, right? So 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 that's we we have now expressed our variation, right? Our our, our we've now expressed essentially we have now expressed our directional derivative. Right, in terms of a dot product between so uh, just now here was grad v phi, right? The direction between grad v phi, and then just now here was v dot grad phi. This is essentially what we're doing by the infinite dimensional case, and it involves integ integration of parts. Okay, any questions? Okay, so so yeah, so 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 here's here's what we call here's what, right now what all I talked so far was I would say. Self-consistent, right? In, in the sense that my notation and everything is consistent with this set of slides. But when you go out there in the in the real world, right, you start to see atrocities like 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 delta s over delta q. What does that even mean? So this this is where I I I 
I, um, I try to help you guys reconcile what you see today in my slides versus what notation you see in the real world. So when I'm working, you see the, in, in the real working world, right? Um, usually, if, if, if you're not sure what's going on, it may seem very complicated. But if you're sure of your intuition, then you can usually say, ah, this term over here, it actually means this thing. Okay? So here's, here's where I try to create a map between outside notation and my slides notation. Right? So okay, first of all, your delta s, we've covered that already. Sometimes you see, instead of eta, they write delta q. Right? And that it's actually, it just means that the delta q just means my eta. Okay? I, I chose to use eta because delta q implies that eta is something to do with q. And I don't like that. Right? I, I, eta itself can be any function you choose. Right? This is delta q. Eta is, is the variation of q, but, but I, I prefer to think of it as any function, like any, any vector v you can choose. Any function eta you can choose. I, I don't like to tie it with q. Okay? So another atrocity you see is um, delta s over delta q. So they'll say this is the this is a functional derivative. I, I, I really don't like that. Because I really don't like this notation because delta s is gradient of a scalar function, right? Delta s is essentially gradient of a scalar function. Right? And, and and when you when you take when you take the when you take the gradient of a uh, a scalar function, you get a vector, right? So if you take a vector and you try to divide it by what is delta q? Delta q is a function. You take a vector, you try to define divide it by a vector, right? This this if you take if you think of it as that, that doesn't make sense. But what they usually mean, right? What they usually mean is the directional derivative, right? The directional derivative um, with respect to delta q. Right? What they usually mean is 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 delta s q, but then this place is a blank slot, right? And, and the reason why I say this is because of the next thing that they usually say, right? So, so the reason why I, I'm, I'm, I'm making this mapping here is for the next, for the third point also. So I'll, I'll say that this usually means this, and that means that it's waiting for a spot here, right? Um, yeah, so, so that, that's, that's how I'll think of this term over here. Then the next term, they say delta s, delta q, delta s over delta q is equal to zero. And the reason why I bolded this zero is because this zero is meant to be a, it's meant to be a function, functional. It's meant to be a functional zero, right? Which is essentially a kind of like a vector, right? And what they usually mean is that this, when when, when they say this delta s delta q equals to zero, they, they mean that this thing, delta s q, waiting for a blank slot eta. This thing is a zero for whatever you put into the blank slot, right? And that just means that whatever you put into the integral here makes the entire thing zero. So this square bracket must be zero. So this usually you, you, you see in textbooks they write delta q, delta s delta q equals zero, then they derive all the Lagrange equations from it. But I don't I don't I don't I don't really like this notation because it's not really clear what's going on. And and yeah, so so this is this how I think of it in terms of infinite dimensional vector calculus, right? In, in the in the mathematical framework, right? I I'm, I I like mathematical rigor when, whenever um it's whenever it's necessary. Okay, and, and so the next thing that okay, any questions about this? Okay, so the next thing that they usually write is delta s over delta q. And I don't like that also, because delta q at some point t, are they choosing some time t, or are they varying respect to the whole function? Right? If they are varying respect to the whole function, then they mean this. If they are choosing a point qt, then they actually mean the next thing. This is actually a partial derivative. So, so this ambiguously means this. Right? And, and yeah, usually they use qt just to say that q is a function of time. But, but I, if, I were, if I were the author, I will write that elsewhere. I wouldn't write it in your function derivative. Okay, and the, the, the last, next thing, if you write partial over here, then you, you actually mean taking respect to this single variable. Right? This above here, of point 0.4 is entire function. Point here is a function at some point in time. Okay, so that, that will evaluate down to the Lagrangian. And so the next thing, say delta s equals to zero, it ambiguously means that, <coughs> it's ambiguous again because when you write delta s equals to zero, you, you didn't specify what, what kind of eta you put in. Is it delta s equals to zero for all eta, or is it for some eta? Right? And this is becoming relevant when we talk about Noether's theorem and conserved charges, or conserved quantities later. Right? And lastly, they write Q uh, maps to that. Usually they just mean variation, but once again, is it some variation or is it all variations? So, so the last two points is more relevant for Noether later conserved quantities. That, 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 that's when we, we really need to be extra careful and know what we're doing. Okay, so, um, so na naturally, this is what I talked about is for one dimension, but you can extend this to two dimensions. Essentially, now instead of infinitely variables, infinitely many variables, 
you have tw twice, right, tw twice the infinity many variables. <laughs> so, so, yeah, so, so you're just doubling, you're just doubling the number of variables, one for each dimension, right? So, um, yeah, so you get the only advanced equation. You do it, if you are conceptually clear on what's going on in the one dimensional case, the extension of two dimensions and more dimensions is actually very, it's, it's, it's quite obvious why this will hold true for all dimensions, right? Because, yeah. So, um, note that we write things like that, delta L and delta X, right? Uh, you could you could get you could get um, terms that are dependent on x dot and y dot. So th and that, that's how you get all the fancy non-linear differential equations for your equations of motion. Okay. So just now I talked about um, all the Lagrange equations. Um, now now I'll, I'll I'll hopefully introduce something very interesting, which is known as Noether's theorem. Okay. So show of hands, how many of you have heard of Noether's theorem? Okay. That's that's good, right? Um, how many of you have not heard of Noether's theorem? Yeah. For the rest of you, I assume you are in the quantum supervision of both. Right. So, Noether's theorem, what's the motivation for it? Noether's theorem tells us, um, okay, first let's talk about conservation. Okay, let's talk about conservation. So, if I put three particles in one dimension, what's the conserved quantities? Right? Lee, because there's no potential, momentum is conserved. Okay? Um, energy is also conserved. Right? And, and the point I want to bring here is that we write the Lagrangian down, three particles in one D, we write the Lagrangian down, we solve the equation of motion, we get this. And the equation of motion itself tells you that momentum is conserved. Right? It's, it's like, it's like it, it, tells you, yeah, it tells you that d over dt mv is constant. It, it, it zero means that mv is constant. Right? So the, you get equations of, you, you get a conserved momentum from the equation of motion. Right? So right now, it, this sounds very boring, but, but I, I'm trying to build up to a bigger point here. So if I have two dimensions, then you, you get other equations for each one of them. You get, you get um, conservation of momentum for each component of momentum, right? Okay, but what's interesting is if we bring a uh, 2D radio potential in. So if you bring a potential in, it breaks, it breaks your uh, breaks your conservation of momentum because your dp over dt is equal to f, right, by Newton's law. And, and your f is, where does the f, where does the force come from? It comes from, for a conservative force, it comes from a potential. Okay, so when you bring in a potential, then the potential creates a, a force. Right? So if in the special case where the potential is only dependent on the radius r, in other words, it's a, it's a rotationally symmetric potential. Right? In the special case, it turns out that even though your momentum, linear momentum is not conserved, your angular momentum is conserved. And how do we know that? Right? Once again, going equation 41, derive <coughs> equations of motion 42 and 43, gets you your euler lagrange equations, gets your equation of motion here, and then we can essentially do from the from your equation of motion, remember this is very systematic, we get equation of motion, we can take the difference of these two weighted by y and x. Right? So I take y minus equation 42 minus x times equation 43, and that will actually give me equation 44. And then you realize that where's the radial part coming? The radial part comes in because partial r over partial y is 2y, right? and partial r over partial x is 2x. So you, if, if you expand it out, only because it's a radial potential, do these two terms cancel nicely. And when these two terms cancel nicely, you get the you get the conservation of angular momentum. Right? So the point I want you guys to know here is where do you guys learn conservation of angular momentum? Usually you learn it from a textbook. Right? They say, oh, this system, if there's no if if there is no torque, right? if there's no torque, then you have conservation of angular momentum. And that's okay, right? But but from a more from the equation, from the Euler, from the Euler mechanics point of view, your conservation of angular momentum comes from your equation of motion rearranged <coughs> in a very clever way to get you this, right? You, 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 you must have some foresight, right? You look at these two equations, who, who, who in their right mind would think, I take y minus y times this minus x times this, right? That, that, that seems like a very, a very crazy, that seems like a very unintuitive step to take, right? It might require a lot of brute force in order for you to get from the equations of motion to the conservation angular momentum, okay? So, so, so you see all this, this brute force method, right? This 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 step requires insight, right? It requires hindsight, right? If I know this is conserved, then I'll, 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 of course I'll think, oh, clearly if I do this step, I'll get that. Right? If I know angular momentum is conserved, I can think of this. But if I don't know angular momentum is conserved, it's very hard to go from these two steps to the last step. By because this this step is very unmotivated. Okay? Any questions? Yeah. So so the, the question now is. 
how do you motivate this? If if I, if I didn't have angular momentum, if you were the one discovering angular momentum, how do you know that to do this test? That's where Lotus theorem comes in. Because Lotus theorem gives you a very systematic procedure, right? With no with no requirement of any insight or any 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 big brain moment, right? Lotus theorem tells you a very systematic procedure to derive conserved quantities. Okay, and it comes from this principle of symmetry. Okay, so, so anyway, just, just, to, just, to, uh, just to motivate it even more, I right, suppose I give you the 3D Kepler problem in, in, in gravity. Um, how many conserved quantities are there? Any, anyone? So there's, there's, there's energy and angular momentum, right? As you guys are familiar with. But there's actually a third one. There's actually, a, there's actually three other quantities. Of, there's actually a vector of conserved quantities. <laughs> And so, so this, this is less well less well known, right? And so the question, if you if you search Wikipedia for this, right, you see a very crazy expression. And you're like, who in their right mind would ever think of getting that conserved quantity, right? Of course, it comes from an equation of motion, but whoever thinks of such a weird quantity, of course, it's a derivation and whatnot. But how, how do we derive it, right? So, so the answer is that we can use the first theorem. So it turns out that. Um, Notice theorem tells you that every continuous symmetry of a system uh, results in a conserved quantity. And so what I mean, what I mean by conserved symmetry of a system? Con con uh, what, what I mean by continuous symmetry of a system? What I mean by that is that if your path of the particle, Q of T, right, is, 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 is transformed by some symmetry, for example, translation, right, then after you transform it, that path right, would also satisfy the equation of motion, would also Minimize the action. We we'll also obey the euler lagrange equations. Right? So, so what we mean by continuous symmetry of a system means that if I have some path that is minimizing the action, if I transform the path in some way according to the symmetry, transform the path like translation, transform the path to another path, that new path must also minimize um, the action. Okay? And and Nolan's theorem tells you that every continuous symmetry would imply a conserved quantity. So right now it may seem very weird. Where, where does this come in? But it turns out that every it turns out that every constant quantity has some corresponding symmetry with it. So for linear momentum, it was spatial translation. And when we added, uh, when we added and, and a testament as an and a test and uh, an example of that would be would be that if I added if I added a potential, the potential breaks spatial translation symmetry. So you no longer have conservation of linear momentum. Okay? And then, so angular momentum is corresponding to rotational symmetry. If you add a potential, but if the potential is rotationally symmetric, you still have rotational symmetry, right? Then, um, th that's why you get conservation angular momentum. And uh, turns out energy is something to do with time, right? So you may have heard of the, the saying that um, actually time in the universe, actually, actually energy in the universe, in the entire universe, is not constant because of inflation, right? So, so when you do the gravitational rate shift, some energy is um, the energy, energy, total energy in the universe has changed. Then you watch the videos and they say, wait, where does energy go? Then they say, actually energy is not conserved. Then you're like, huh? Where got? Right? Then, so, so the answer is that if you think of systems, <coughs> systems that have time transition symmetry have conservation energy. And so it totally makes sense that the universe might not necessarily have time transition symmetry right, due to inflation. So, 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 so understanding this principle helps you, helps you, helps you lift Helps you, helps you think of, helps you be comfortable with the fact that in some systems energy is not conserved. Okay. Yeah, Laplace, Laplace root lens vector actually corresponds to something called like SO4. Right? SO4 being a Lie group, but, but it's, it's just some fancy symmetry. And actually electromagnetism is actually due to U1 symmetry. U1 being the U1 being the the the, the, the symmetry, the, the Lie group of unit length complex numbers. Right? So your complex numbers actually plays a role in, in the electromagnetism, right? It, 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 that, that's, that's quite interesting. Yeah. Okay. So, so, okay, so, so usually the proof for Nocturne's theorem would involve a bunch of symbols like your euler lagrange equation, but usually, usually you don't really know what's going on. Uh, uh, okay, not, not you usually, usually I don't really see what's really intuitively happening. So I hope to give you some intuition for Nocturne's theorem. So I'm going to consider the simplest system, right? But this intuition, if you are sure of this intuition, if you have this intuition, it applies to any other, almost almost any other system. Okay, so if, if I have some, if I have just half mb squared, right, then you can see that clearly this 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 Lagrangian has um, translation symmetry in the sense that if I translate 
the position by a constant amount, then this new function will still will still minimize the action, right? Because substituting this in, the derivative brings away the a, right? You still get the same Lagrangian. So, so we say that this Lagrangian has spatial translation symmetry, right? Um, yeah. And, and, and so what it means is that the black path minimizes the action. That will also imply that because of the symmetry of the system, that will also imply that the red path minimizes the action, right? Um, of course, of course, if your actual Lagrangian is half mv squared, then this would be a straight line, but 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 this is sim this is this is just intuition. Okay, so so if you have translational symmetry, then what if right, what if I construct a new path? So what if I construct a new path, which is the blue path, when inter interpolate between the black path and the red path. So I go the black path for some time, then I move to the red path, then I go the red path for some time and move back to the black path. Okay? So so this in this interpolated path, right? Question, does it minimize the action or not? Right? So so, so the interpolated path, first of all, I construct it mathematically as x of t, the original path, plus epsilon of t, which is some bump function, right, times a. So this this epsilon of t, you can think of it as between 0 and 1, right? And then it goes 0, 0, 0, 0, and it goes maybe linearly, or it can be any way, right? But it just moves to 1, and it goes, 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 and it goes down. It goes, 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 goes. So you can think of this epsilon as a bump function that it helps you interpolate between the two paths. Right? And for simplicity, you can choose any bump function you want. Uh, you can choose any epsilon, uh, but I chose this bump function because because we don't need to be too complicated to arrive at Lotus uh, conserve quantities. So yeah, any questions so far? Okay, so so question now is which, which of let's let's play the game of who minimizes the action. Right? So black path minimizes the action. Red path, which is x plus uh, the the original path. Plus a constant translation that also minimizes the path. But what about um, the blue path? What about x of t plus epsilon t a? Does that minimize action? And the answer is, is is no, right? Because if I split the blue path into five segments, right? The blue plus the purple plus the blue plus the purple plus the blue. You see that the blue paths clearly they minimize action because they trace along the black and the red paths. But the purple paths they clearly deviate from they clearly deviate from the the, the minimal 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 action path. Right? So so the purple path would cause my blue path, this this third path, to not minimize the action. Right? Okay, so, so that, that 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 is if I interpolate between the two paths, there's no reason why there's no reason why the interpolated path should minimize the action. Unless unless we take A to be very small. Right? And why is that so? Because we know that X of T, the black path, obeys the order Lagrange equations, which means that it minimizes the action, which means that up to first order any variation, the, the first the, 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 the functional differential right is zero. Right? So so because the black path obeys the principle of stationary action, then any infinitesimal, any small variation will also keep the action the same. Right? So as a result we get that if A is very, very small, Right? Actually, the blue path, the third path, actually does minimize the action. Okay? And using that, using that, we can we can we can see that the purple contributions must hence be zero, right? So the blue is zero, the blue here is originally zero, the blue is originally zero, right? Initially the purple paths are not zero. If for a finite big A. Right? But if we bring A very, very small, then the purple paths must sum to zero. Right? And that means that this contribution here must cancel out this contribution here, right? And th this is where this is where we see Notus theorem. This this is essentially the Notus procedure, because this purple part, right? Remember, where does purple come from? Come from? It comes from our choice of epsilon t, right? It comes from our choice of bump function. If we chose the bump function to be anything else, we can we can we think of sliding this purple part along the path anywhere we want, right? And that means that the purple parts itself. Must be, must be, um, that, yeah. So, so we think of sliding the purple path along the, the, the thing, and that generates, that essentially generates your conserved quantities. So, this is the intuition for it. You can think of, you can, I, I like to think of these purple paths as, um, this is my own phrasing, right? This is not found anywhere in the literature, but I kind of like to think of it as nota flux, right? Because every time you deviate from the path, there's some amount of, there's some amount of change to the action, right? And the change to the action is kind of like a flux. What, what flux goes in must, in the flux that comes out also. 
Okay, so so yeah, so um, so going to the math. This is the this is the motivation. But going to the math, uh, we we will show. Okay, so so the math always says something like that. It always says the variation with respect to s of t of a must be equal to zero because x of t is uh is is it satisfies the equation of motion, the other branch equations, right? So the first equality here, this equation. 48 is the is the is the main point. The first equality is due to x of t satisfying equation of motion. The second equality, the second equality here is the derivation that we're going to cover now, right? And the derivation is usually in the following form. So usually they, they you, you do something like that. Right? So this is just substituting in the definition. Uh, the definition you for the our choice of Lagrangian is this right? half m v squared, but now the v is this very v. Then over here we expand it out, right, to terms linear in A, right, first order in A. Then this part you see we have an x dot and an e dot, epsilon dot, right? X dot and epsilon dot. We integrate with parts because we're gonna isolate out the epsilon. So we integrate with parts to get this. And remember that this epsilon of t is a function we chose. Right? This epsilon of t is a function we chose, so we can choose it to we can we we, we can choose it to vanish at the end points. Right? So if we choose that, then we get this quantity. And we get back to equation 52. So this derivation justifies the second equality. Okay? So what do we get over here? We get that this, this equation 48 is, is something um, quite remarkable. Uh, which is that if the first equality, there's two equalities here. First one being from the equation of motion. Only if your x of t, only if your particle's trajectories is obeying the equation of motion, right, then you get it equals to zero. And what's the other equality here? This equality comes from our derivation, which is this thing, but intuitively, right? Intuitively, th this is the math, right? But, but the intuition is the previous few slides. And, and if you compare the far left hand side and far right hand side, right? Then you get that essentially, you, you see this quantity over here. Um, epsilon of t is something that, that we chose. So it, it's, any, it's anything that we chose. Right, so similar to just now where the dot product equals to zero for all vectors v, that implies that, that the vector itself is, that is dotted with v must be equal to zero. Similarly, this implies that the quantity inside here must be zero. And this is how you obtain um, your constant quantities. Right? So, so if, if I were to summarize, summarize how Noto's procedure works, right, it's equation 53, right, where, where, we, where we do this step over here, and, and, then, and then we imply that this is the, the, the term inside here is zero, and that is a constant quantity. Right? Because time derivative of something is zero means that the object inside is constant. So to, the, the, the procedure we perform to obtain constant quantities is first to identify a symmetry of the system. And symmetry of the system might be difficult to identify, but at least it's easier than making a bunch of unmotivated algebraic expansions of the equation of motion. Right? At least a symmetry is it, it, easier, easier to identify from, 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 the, get, from the Lagrangian. Right? So, from, yeah, so, so the, we first identify symmetry. Then we, the symmetry is some constant shift, right? Mathematically, what we do is we promote the constant shift into a local shift, meaning that it's, it's a, it's a non-constant shift, right? And then, from the, from the pictures we drew just now, right, the flux and whatnot, that motivates our derivation, that motivates our math. And after that, we get that this quantity must, this, this, this bottom integral, must be equal to zero. And that implies that Q is a constant quantity. Q mean, usually meaning charge. Because we, we often call we often call the things that are derived from symmetries local charges. Right? Um, yeah, but, but it, it, in classical mechanics it's just quantities. No constant quantities. So so the the, the idea here is um, I'm, for me at least when I first saw the derivation of Noether's theorem, right, they, they don't they, they usually have a bunch of equations. Then they'll say this is true, this is true. They usually show they usually show this this equation. They usually essentially show these bunch of steps. Then you, you may be asking questions like, oh, why is epsilon a, a, a time dependent function, right? Why 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 do I put in a time dependent function? Why do I put in a time dependent shift when only the constant shift is actually your 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 symmetry of the system? Then you're like, why why do you do that, right? When when it's, when it shouldn't happen. Then the next step they usually do is um. Is they usually yeah they usually do this which is just liquid parts but I think the key idea here is 
why do they put in an epsilon of t? Right? Why is this a function of t when the symmetry itself is not a function of t, when the symmetry itself is a constant shape? Right? And, and, and they usually say, oh, this is a, this is a cute notus trick. Right? Um, yeah, they, they usually say this is just a trick. And, and, and what I hope to have um, imparted to you guys today is the intuition for this trick. Right? The intuition for why this trick works in the first place. Right, so, so mathematically, I would say that usually they say this thing, then they say, oh, this should be blah, 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 blah. But, but I think intuitively, I like to draw pictures so that the picture was um, hopefully a uh, more intuitive reason why this trick works. Okay? So I understand if, if you, you guys didn't know Lotus, uh, Lotus theorem from the, from the start, it, it might be a bit much to digest. But um, I invite you, if you guys ever study Lotus theorem, which I hope, I, I'm sure you guys will, uh, if you guys are confused, remember that um, on, on 10th of January, right, 2024, right, I, I gave this talk and hopefully you can rewatch the lecture and then hopefully you, you can get the intuition, right? So, so yeah. Okay, so now with, with uh, oh boy, we don't have much time. Um, okay, but, but in summary, right, the continuous symmetry is, 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 is important because my flash, can you hear? Ready the mic cut off? Yeah, so, so. Oh, okay, then I'll just, I'll just shout then. Okay, so the continuous symmetry is important because we must be able to interpolate between the, the two paths continuously, right? And then symmetry is important because we leave the action invariant. Um, and yeah, the... Oh, it works again. Okay, so the symmetry is important. Yeah, I, I, I won't repeat what I just said. Um, okay, so, so with what little time we have left, right, I want to have a bit of fun with symmetry. So, what we talked about so far is symmetries in and, and symmetries are studied in math in something known as group theory. I think some of who, who has heard of group, who has learned group theory or heard of group theory before? <coughs> oh, oh, that's that's sad. Okay. <laughs> um, okay, but anyway, symmetries are studied in group theory, and continuous symmetries specifically are, are are extra nice because continuous symmetries allow you to have a concept of generators, and I'll talk about what generators is in the last few minutes. Right, and this is study all in Lie yeah. theory. Right, it's pronounced as Lie, not Lie. Okay, so so what I hopefully present next is going to be uh, the mic isn't working yet. What I hopefully present next is going to be hopefully uh, intuition. Okay, it's a bit hard for intuition, but what I hopefully present next is is um is, is some fun you can have when you talk about symmetry. Okay, and and just note that just like the previous slides, there's very rigorous backing to all this. Right, I, I'm I'm not just pulling this out from my Buttocks. Okay. <laughs> um, you see, I like to give these lectures because I've learned all the all the all the rigorous stuff, but but it's hard to learn the rig all the rigorous stuff in, in one setting. So I hope to share with you guys the intuition for, for, for some of these interesting rigorous stuff and all the hindsight you can get from studying like physics, theoretical physics. Alright, so okay. First of all, symmetry of a function. If I say f of x plus a is equal to f of x for all a, what does that tell you? That tells you the function is constant, right? Intuitively. But how do we derive it? We can derive it by Taylor expanding f of x plus a. Then we get we get this. And if f of x must be equal to f of x plus a, then we can get dx f of dx is zero. But what's interesting here is that this a d over dx is actually known is actually called a generator. And it's called a generator because um, it generates a symmetry, but but it is it's a confusing word. But but um, I'll, I'll tell you what, what you can do with the generator of the symmetry, right? Now, question: If f of x plus a equals f of x for all a implies that d f over d x is zero, how can I go the other direction? And how can I say that d f of d x equals zero implies translational symmetry? And the answer is that um, it implies translational symmetry because if derivative of a function is equal to zero, then higher derivatives of a function are also equal to zero. Right? And that means I can take a, I can do symbolically this exponential of this a d over dx. Recently, there's a new video dropped by a mathematic that goes through what this actually means. For now, you can think of it just as a symbolic Taylor expansion, uh, no, symbolic expansion of, of, of the exponential. But but there's actually once again very rigorous mathematical backing behind all this. Okay, so you, you get this, and you get equation 60. Right, you get essentially a Taylor expansion. You apply exponential of a d over dx on f, you get a Taylor expansion of f of x plus a. Okay, and if I look at the last two equations, 60 and 61, then if the higher derivatives all cancel, that will imply that f of x goes to f of x plus a. So this is this is just, the, the reason why I share this is because I want to share this idea where you can exponentiate 
a generator to get back a finite large symmetry transformation. Right? So, so the idea in Lie theory is that if I have some symmetry, f of x plus a equals f of x, I can take infinitesimal <coughs> symmetries to get the generator. And the idea is that if I want to go from the generator to the big finite large symmetry, I can take exponential of the generator to get the large symmetries. And who here study quantum mechanics? <laughs> okay, but the point is if you study quantum mechanics, you see this exponential applied to some matrix. You see this exponential applied to some derivative, right? And then you'll be like, what are they doing? Right? But that's actually what they're doing. They're actually taking the exponential of a generator. So the exponential has different layers of attraction. You guys learn exponential in primary school as repeated multiplication. Right? Then you guys learn exponentiation in JC to be Taylor ex to, to be to be the, the ex Taylor expansion. Right? And then what you guys will learn in uni um, will be that the exponential is the map that takes generators of a symmetry to large symmetry um, objects, large symmetry translations. Okay? And, and, and that idea is essentially phrased mathematically, exponential of a Lie algebra generator is your Lie group transformation. Right? So that, that's, that, that's why physicists are crazy about this. Right? Because it's, it's very nice. Right? And, and, um, yeah, and this applies all the way to your standard model of particle <coughs> physics. So the standard model of particle physics makes use of this exponential map a lot, a lot. Okay? And and yeah, so so that's 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 that. Um, okay, so so that's a bit of fun with rotation, right? Rotational symmetry of a scalar field will imply this, right? So likewise this is for XY rotation, but you can have for the other two dimension the other two rotations as well. And if you take that expense, right, we take infinitesimal transformations. Right, so just now the parameter that parameterized the translation was A. Right, we take A to be very small. So we take the parameter that parameterizes this translation for, for this one is theta. So you take theta to be very small, you get you get you get this, you take that extended out multivariate calculus, you get this. Right? You take you get this plus theta of this <coughs> operator <coughs> acting on V. So this is what we call the generator for rotation. Right? So, so you can see the parallel, right? We, we do the, essentially the same procedure but for a different symmetry transformation. So now, this is a differential operator because it eats a function and outputs a function. Right? So question is, can you exponentiate that? Yes, you absolutely can. Right? But what I'm going to uh, show you next is, is known as commutator. So if you are studying quantum mechanics, you guys have heard of commutator and whatnot. That's, that's very related to all this. Right? So if I have a differential operator like this, and differential operator like this, I can compose them by applying one after another. And the point I'm showing you this working is just to say that this partial or partial x expands as a product rule over these two. Right, that's just to tell you what exactly you are doing. So if you do this, get this. So you define a commutator of two differential operators to be a of a composed b minus b composed a. Right, and you see do quantum mechanics <coughs> something you see very often as a commutator. We call that the the the, 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 the angular momentum algebra, right, or something like that. Then you know x of p commutator x of p you get i h bar something like that, right? So the fun I want you guys to have here. Um, Okay, the fun, the, fun, the fun part is that you consider that all three generators right, of, of translations, you consider all uh, of rotation, all three generators of rotation, and you commute them, you actually get each other. So it, you get you commute X, LX and LY, you get LD. And this makes sense because you think of it as a tiny, tiny transformation. The generator is a tiny transformation, tiny symmetry transformation. So you do a tiny symmetry transformation, followed by another tiny symmetry transformation, minus that one, minus the stuff that one, you get back a symmetry transformation. So this this is this all studied in Lie group theory and whatnot, but it is it's uh it's no coincidence that you get back each other, right? If you commute them with each other you get back um, the same things. And yeah, so so what we call equation seventy five to seventy seven is we call them the Lie algebra of rotations. Right? So the SO3, the math frac SO3 over here is what we call the Lie algebra SO3. Um, yeah, so, 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 okay, so, what's remarkable is that the, 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 the three commutation relations I showed just now, not only hold true for differential operators, you can find matrices that satisfy the same commutated, commutation relations. And you find matrices, and, and, and in this case, the commutator of matrices just mean matrix multiplication. So you may be wondering, wait a minute, I have differential operators that satisfy that, that satisfy this relation. I have matrices that satisfy this relation. 
there must be some parallel between the matrices and the differential operators. And the answer is that absolutely, right? If you look at these two, you see is if you look at the, like y and then del over del x, you can see that these two are that there's some parallel between them, right? There's a minus sign here, and, and if you look at the other symmetry, then there's a very nice mapping between them. And this is not a coincidence, right? So if you like if you if you are intrigued by this, then um, maybe a map is for you, right? So 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 <laughs> these, these are known as different representations of the same Lie algebra. And so mathematicians what they do, right? What they do is that they what, what mathematicians and theoretical physicists like to do is they like to look at this algebra and then they ask themselves a very fun question, right? Uh, or, 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 very, or very bad question, if, if, depending on which side you're on. Uh, they ask themselves a very fun question, which is that what is all the possible representations of it? And remarkably, right? I mentioned this a bit in my special relativity lecture, right? But remarkably, if you consider all the representations of this algebra, you get all your particles in, in quantum mechanics, you get your your, your spin, uh, spin zero particles, you get your you get your electromagnetism, right? You get your your electrons, you get your you get your everything. You get by considering representations of rotation algebra, right? Mathematically, you get you get all your particles essentially. And 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 what they can do with these representations is they can start to construct the grungeons, right? They can start to construct, you can start to piece together different representations into a single Lagrangian, and they write down any Lagrangian they can, right? and then they write down Lagrangian, and they explore consequences of the Lagrangian. So, if you're a theoretical physicist, what you do for your day job is you, 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 you study the math first, you study the math first, okay, maybe that's boring, but what's the fun part? The fun part is that you take all these Lego building blocks, all these representations, all these particles, and then you construct your own fun Lagrangian. It can be crazy, it can be crazy Lagrangian, right? You construct your own fun Lagrangian, and then you see, whoa, I built my own universe, kind of, right? And then you, you, you study the consequences of that, and, um, and, and yeah, and, and, and I, I think um, that's fun. And so, the closing remark, my closing remark will be that um, Physics Olympiad, uh, of course, is, is, uh, is, is fun, I suppose, for some of you, right? Uh, so, but, but Physics Olympiad is definitely not the end, right? Physics Olympiad is actually just your first two years of undergrad. Uh, in other words, this basic Olympiad is just your all your all your non-quantum stuff, right? I think the fun really starts when you study quantum mechanics and theoretical physics. So uh, okay, so why am I sharing with you guys this? It's because I want to hopefully convert some of you guys to theoretical physics. So if, if for a lot of people a lot of people do physics Olympiad, then they usually very stressed, right? You do oh, I must get into I4, I get into K4, then you get very stressed. Then you, you, you go into I4 already, then you're like, wow, I must get it. Right? Then you're very stressed, you do, 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 do. Right? I, I, I talk to seniors and stuff, a lot of them, uh, some of them, a lot of them, they, they burn out after that. And then after that, they don't even do physics in uni. Right? And, and so, right, unlike math, where all your fields medalists happen to sometimes be math Olympiad people also, right? unlike math, um, physics Olympiad actually, you don't see that much of that. Right? You see all the Nobel Prize winners. They, they, they I, I don't think, it is usually um, they they don't often all the all the physics academy people usually don't come from Olympiad background. Of course, there's some overlap, um, but usually the, the, the overlap is not so big, right? And and I think the difference is that uh, if you burn out from physics Olympiad, right, you won't, you get you miss out all the fun of theoretical physics. Okay, so my my, my advice to you guys is um, the journey to physics is theoretical physics and your PhD if you do one is very very long. So don't 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 burn up from this Olympia piece because it's just it's 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 just very it's, it's just it's just very little stuff compared to the vast interestingness of the vast sea of theoretical physics. Okay? And in fact, um, if it's any word of encouragement to you guys, I think some of you here said it before. Right, uh, I I some of the phys my, my physics PhD friend he got C for A level physics. Right, and now, and then after he went on to get a PhD in theoretical physics. So the point is that. Your physics grades and your physics Olympiad grades don't really matter that much in the long run, right? And 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 the, and, and a lot of string theories and whatnot, they, they don't even come from um, physics background. The best string theorist is a historian, right? Uh, used to be a historian, right? And and the and the Singapore's best string theorist, he used to study electrical engineering, right? So the point is that theory of physics is if you're interested in it, 
you can definitely do it, right? You just need a lot of time and patience and enjoy the process along the way. So, uh, if there's one message that I want you to take away from this is, um, please don't burn out from Physics Olympiad. That will be such a waste of your bright minds and talents. Okay? So, yeah, if that's all. Thank you. And you like here, and you want to study more theoretical physics or, or physics or theory, right? I have these two channels over here. My 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 this right channel is the one that I mostly pu publish more theoretical physics content, right? Um, yeah. So so I do subscribe to my two YouTube channels. So so that's the main takeaway from from, from the lecture. Okay. okay. So thank you, thank you. Okay, thanks everyone. We overrun by a little bit, uh, but uh, hope this was a useful first session for everyone. Uh, and come back here next week. Okay, uh, Mr. Wong, uh, will, I'll tell you who's the next lecturer on a week by week basis, lah. Right. Uh, and uh, just want to do look at the homework and start doing it. Okay. See you. Any any questions? You can just ask on the Discord. I know I borrowed somebody's pen at the start, so please uh, come and give me back. Thank you so much. Right, we're going to do it. And we try to clear out quickly because so that the left side can uh, lock up this place.